So I've made some content before on IPv6, and one question I always get is, why should I be using IPv6 in my home lab? And today I'm gonna to go through an example scenario of how IPv6 can solve real world routing problems, simplify our network architecture, and bring back end-to-end -end connectivity between hosts. That's a really, really beneficial thing. It's how the internet was originally designed, and IPv6 was intended to bring it back, get rid of the network translation, get rid of the SNI proxies, all that stuff, isn't really needed anymore, and I'm gonna explain why. So hop into this video, and let's see if we can understand why we should be running IPv6 in the home lab. So I've got an example set up over here on the computer. It's probably about what your home lab will look like when you get started. So we have two servers here. So we got a home assistant and a Jellyfin. We gave them each IP addresses. Now these two servers, they could be two containers, they could be two virtual machines. However you set it up, point is, you've got two services running. So now S at home, this guy down here, we want to connect to these services. So we type in the address. Since we're on the same local network, the connection just goes right there. It's pretty easy. This is about the path our connection takes. We send a request, goes over the LAN, goes to Home Assistant. Pretty easy, right? But this doesn't really scale. Remembering numbers, remembering IP addresses, not a great way to go about things, especially if we want to share our servers with our friends and family. So that's why man invented DNS. So we put the name in DNS. Now we type the name in, get directly there, nice and easy. But what happens when we're outside of our home? How does that route work? Yeah, our guy has no idea how to get to 192.168.1.10. That's not a valid address on the internet. No network is gonna route it. Or you could be on a network that also has a 192.168.1.10. So now you can't get to Home Assistant. You're trying to connect to some other random server or computer. It's not a good time. So this happens because when we're outside of our network, our public IP is the only IP we can access. So what we really need to do is we need a port forward through our firewall router from our public IP to the internal IP. So let's set up a port forward. So now we set up a port forward, but we can only port forward one port to one destination. So in this case, I chose home assistance. So now we just can't get the jellyfin outside of our house. Well, I guess we'll fix that later. So in order to fix the problem where we can only port forward one port at a time, we want to put all our traffic on port 443, the standard HTTPS port. So we're going to use a reverse proxy. In this case, I've used caddy. So now when I try to connect, I go to the public IPv4, I get port forwarded up to caddy. Caddy looks at the SNI header and decides where it should go. Maybe it decides to go to Home Assistant or it decides to go to Jellyfin. Ha! So what's the path now if my guy on in the inside tries to connect to Jellyfin? Where does his connection have to go? So look at this disaster. I connect to Jellyfin. I'm going up to my public IP. So I'm sending a packet out to my router. My router is going to hopefully look at that and say, ah, oh, that's me and do a hairpin. So it's coming back in on the WAN interface, going through the firewall again, going through NAT again. Then it's getting sent to the caddy server. Then the caddy server can do reverse proxying and send it out to the Jellyfin server. So if I'm watching a video at some megabits per second, I don't know, 25 megabits per second, that data is going from the Jellyfin server out onto the network, up to the caddy server, back onto the network, over to the firewall, back from the firewall into my client. That's quite a hell of a path to take. And if you've got a lot of clients, even just a couple clients watching videos, you could easily have a single gigabit ethernet connection somewhere on there that gets saturated just because you're going back and forth so many times. So the next solution people try to fix IPv4 is split horizon DNS. What if we let our internal clients talk directly to Jellyfin and our external clients go through the proxy? Let's set that up and see how that looks. We take DNS here, we have public DNS and we'll have our internal DNS. So inside, we can change this. So now each client is getting a different IP address to go to. Clients on the internal network using our internal DNS service get the internal name. They connect directly to the Jellyfin server, they're happy. Clients on the outside get the public IP address. They hit our public IP, they go through the firewall NAT port forward, end up at the caddy server, Caddy server does SNI inspection, sends it on Jellyfin. Now we're only going through this whole awful process for people outside of our network, which honestly makes sense. It's not, not the worst thing in the world. But what happens if you've got some smart web browser like Chrome that's like, I'm gonna use 8.8.8.8 for everything without telling the user, or I'm gonna do DNS over TLS or something. Now what happens? That's right. Chrome was trying to be helpful to us with security, bypassed our internal DNS server. Now we're taking the awful path again. Not great. 
what if we could just put both of these guys on a public IP address? If you're on the local network, you connect directly to it via the public IP address. And if you're external, you come into the router, get routed as usual. So how much would that cost? So here is APNIC. They are a regional internet registry. And according to this, the price goes, oh God, wow, that's a lot for an address. So if we were to buy an address, we might be paying like 50 or 60 bucks per address if we're not renting it. And you can only buy in segments of 20 slash 24. So you're spending like, how much is that? Got $15,000 to buy a subnet so you can have public IP addresses. It's also not quite a deal either because if we buy public IP addresses, even if we rent them for our ISP for a few dollars a month, those end up as addresses on the router. They're not routable on the local subnet. So unless every local client has a route to the public address, it's still gonna hairpin through the router. It just doesn't have to go through the caddy step to get there. So public IPv4 buying, not a great option. But what about v6? So modifier drawing a bit. Now everyone has IPv6. We put our IPv6 in DNS, no port forwarding. We just have to enable rules in our stateful firewall to let the packets in, but we don't have to NAT them. They're not translated. They still keep their same address. So let's look how routing works now. So my guy on the inside, he goes to 401E and he goes directly there because he is on the same subnet. So he just routes directly on link because he's also on 2001 DB8 in our hypothetical example. So he goes right there, he's happy. Guy on the outside, he's like, I need to go to 2001 DB8, 401E. He finds a route to 2001 DB8, goes through the router, finds 401E, he's happy. Again, if you wanna to go to the Jellyfin server too, same process, you type the address in, go to DNS, get the address, you go straight there. If you're on the local subnet, you go straight there. You don't have to go to the router, do a hairpin. Um, none, of that, none of that junk, you're just, the address is a publicly audible address. You route using IP as IP was intended. You take the quickest destination, don't go up through the router and mess with all that. Now the only problem could be if you're on a network that doesn't have V6. So if you're inside your own network, you have V6, all your clients have V6, they're gonna prefer V6 over V4, unless you're using ULA addresses. You'll go straight there, you'll be happy. If you're outside, if you're on a mobile provider, there's a really good chance you have V6, at least in most of the world. If you're on a fixed provider, you, eh, about 50-50 or so. If you have Comcast, you probably have it. Your ISP should provide it, but not, a lot, not all of them do. Google statistics say roughly 50% of their traffic comes over V6 right now, so that's a pretty good sign. It's going up every year, but it's not 100%. So you might be on some network, especially business networks or public Wi-Fi, that just uh, admins are super lazy. You can watch tons of YouTube channels from like professional MSPs and sysadmins that just say, we just disable V6 because we don't like dealing with hard things and change. And um, for those kind of networks, if you're on that kind of public Wi-Fi, you still need to be able to get to your stuff over V4 but hopefully that's a minority. So let's see how we would set that up. So we're gonna bring back our caddy proxy. This time though, caddy is gonna do V4 to V6 translation. So because caddy is either doing a layer four TCP or layer seven HTTPS transaction, it can bind a TCP session from IPv4 to IPv6 without really doing, it's not doing protocol translation because it's, it's terminating the TCP session starting a new one or terminating the TLS session starting a new TLS session. So in this case, we're gonna take our public IP port forward it to Caddy, and then give Caddy the V6 addresses of our servers. So now we're on a public Wi-Fi hotspot. It doesn't give us a V6 address, so we can't use V6. So we take the purple path. So now our public guy, he comes into the firewall. He hits the firewall's public IP. He gets port forwarded up to the Caddy server. Caddy looks at TLS, SNI, forwards us on. All is good. Now the cool thing about this is all of our traffic is not going through the Caddy server. The only traffic that has to go through the Caddy server is traffic from clients on legacy networks. So if most of our clients are on our internal network, they are not going to the Caddy server and they are not going to the router. They are taking the direct path. If our clients are external on their phones, they're also probably on a V6 network. They go to the router because they have to come in, but they don't have to go to the Caddy server. The only people that are going up to the Caddy server are people on V4. And over time, usage of this should go down as more and more clients get access to V6. So this server should eventually obsolete itself and you can decommission it as soon as all of your friends and family that actually use your Jellyfin server um, get upgraded to V6. Also, not sure if you noticed, when we went to V6, we got rid of Split Horizon DNS. Don't have to worry about that anymore because all V6 addresses are public. There's no difference between the V6 address inside and the V6 address outside. It's just the V6 address of that router. We still have the stateful firewall 
and the firewall still has to allow the packet in, but it's not translating the packet anymore. There's no port forward. We're not changing the address or port. We're just allowing the packet through. So the firewall still denies packets that come in by default. We just have to say allow packets destined for this v6 address. We don't have to say when a packet comes in, change the destination, change the port. That's port forwarding. We're not doing that. We're just allowing it through the firewall. So hopefully you can appreciate how bringing back end-to-end -end routing in IPv6 really improves things. Every address is public. We don't have to have split horizon DNS. We don't have to have internal and external networks. All that stuff, it's just the address. We figure out how to get there via the route and all is good. This is a setup I'm gonna be running in my new network. Everything is gonna be IPv6 primary. So all of my services will talk IPv6 to each other. I will still have an IPv4 gateway so that if I'm out about on a network that doesn't support v6 i can still connect back to my stuff but in general that shouldn't really need a ton of bandwidth and basically i hope you guys enjoyed this video if you want to chat more with me there's a discord link down below i love talking about ipv6 huge fan of v6 and everyone should be running it um like and subscribe oh yeah don't forget that like and subscribe youtube loves that and uh, i'll see you guys on the next adventure